there's a time and a place for for philosophy, I guess. And there's only so many questions you can ask and not get an answer to. <laughs> there's only so many questions you can ask. That's uh, very philosophical in itself. That's a wow. That's a, a, a very heavy topic. There are only so <laughs> many questions you can ask. So you know, why even bother? Yeah, I mean, it's also true on a, a general basis. I mean, we only live for so many day days. <laughs> Jesus. You're like, <laughs> hey, what's in the cupboard? What's in the cupboard? What's in the cupboard? What's in the cupboard? What is in the cupboard? <laughs> <laughs> 70 years later. What's in the cupboard? <laughs> what's in the cupboard? <laughs> is it my cough medicine? <laughs> All these years later, it's like, yes. <laughs> Turns out the cupboard was in me the whole time. Oh, <laughs> uh, um, yeah. So we're back on Banjo Kazooie again this week. I uh, I'm gonna push it for as long as I can. It's one of those things where you you have um. So I I was I was pretty much fed up of this game at this point last week. I was like, yep, I'm done now. And then a week later, just because I've not touched it or anything. I'm firmly back in the mood of no, I'm the, yeah, I'm I'm gonna enjoy this. I'm gonna I'm gonna find um, that spark of enjoyment that I had all those years ago. I know I will. I know I can. So um, I'm uh, I'm back in the um, kind of naive. Back in the habit. Yeah, back in the habit, along with all. Just my like other. Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> Hang on, it says uh, Hangout Episode Three. Did I miss one? Have you been recording behind my back? Oh, does it? What's it well, say that? right now. Uh, the Charisma Vacuum Hangout number three. On the title? Yeah. Uh, I've never needed to change a title before when, I, when we've been streaming. Let me have a look. Um. Oh, I'll do that later. Yeah. Uh, no. Well, it's, that will make no sense to people tuning in <laughs> after the fact. After, I, after I've already edited it. <laughs> <laughs> they'll just think they're going mad. Oh, well. Don't we all? Um... Yeah, you had a busy day or something the other day, you you were telling me, or, or a fun day or something like that. Uh, you were going to explain to me what the, where the where the enjoyment came from. Was I? I honestly can't yeah. remember. It's been, it's been a long day today, I can tell that much. Because you were like... I'd, I'd... Sorry, go on. Oh, crap. I, I honestly can't remember what day that would have been. Hang on, I'm going to have to scroll through the WhatsApp chat to find out what day that was. <laughs> So I can work out, was that a day I was on a manic high or a suicidal low? Uh, ah. da, 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 da. It definitely wasn't last night, because I was watching a bit of Michael Bay's Transformers. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, wow, there's a lot of... I'd have killed myself. <laughs> Chats. I should really read through these more often. There's a lot of red flags. Uh, <laughs> I have to stop titling these films. Something about She-Hulk. Oh, balls. Was it before or after we decided to both watch Gold Knight at the same time? Oh, did you ever get around to that? I did, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, that was... Um, oh, what day would that have been? Monday? Yeah, that would have been Monday. I decided based on uh, your recommendation, it's like, you know what, fuck it, it's, it's midday, I've got nothing else to do, I need a bit of that <laughs> excitement in my life, I'll stick Goldeneye on, and it's, it did not disappoint. It's midday, I'm already drinking, <laughs> I'm not wearing <laughs> any clothes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're just summing up the life of a student. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> we can't all be clothed and playing Banjo-Kazooie in our spare time. When, well, I mean, it's it, to do. Only, only half clothes, it's very warm tonight. I don't know yeah, it's it stupidly hot. Um, so what did you think then after, I mean, when was the last time you saw Goldeneye? Um, ooh, good question, probably about, th it was before I went to Costa Rica, so it would have been 2017. Mm. Me, uh, me and a friend, uh, who we always pick sort of madcap movie ideas to watch, we decided that for my going away present, uh, before we didn't see each other for a, a good few months or years, who knows, was we were going to sit down and watch every single intro scene followed by song for all 23 of the Bond movies or whoever many were at that point. Oh, that's a waste of time I can get behind. It it was. It was the best part of a whole afternoon spent doing that. Some of them just go on and on and on. And when you get to... Oh, Jesus, which one is it? Um, there's one in particular. I think it's Die Another Day. Uh, I think Die Another Day. And the first section is like 20 Shoot. minutes of film you want to sit through to get to that awful Madonna song <laughs> before the oh, movie itself can properly yeah. begin. 
Yeah, so that was good fun. Um, but then after that, we decided uh, we'll just watch Goldeneye as well. <laughs> we had fun with that one, so let's just finish the movie. Which one stood out then for you? Which which the bomb? Oh, this stupid shark! For fuck's sake. Um, which one were you like? Um... Yeah, which one stood out? I don't need to explain any more than that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, no, no, please. Go. Uh, I'm not quite getting it. There's a thread there, but I'm not quite able to grip it. <laughs> Probably from Russia with Love, because I remember... I can't remember anything about that film. There was a train in it, I think. Um, oh, tr But you could say that yeah. about Spectre and, and many, many others. Russia with Love is, is one of the Bond films I've only ever watched once. Uh, so the post-credit... The pre-credit scene got me quite excited for it before we turned it off and <laughs> moved on to... Goldfinger? Goldfinger. Uh, really should go back and rewatch that one at one point because I know it's your favourite. From from Rush with Love, yeah, it's yeah, um, it's, it's it's a great film, really it's a really good. Spy movie. It, it's yeah, it is yeah. Um, it's in that niche period where they were still trying to figure out what Bond was, and mm. um, the they kind of just defaulted to gritty spy um, thriller, and it's just it's just exceptional. I, I think I mentioned this to you before that uh, when, when we were discussing mm -hmm. it last time that uh, that's what they based Casino Royale on was um, was from Rush with, with Love. And, you mean uh, the one with I want to say Woody Allen? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> the no. real Casino Royale. <laughs> the real Casino Royale. No, I mean the, the Daniel Craig one. Unfortunately, uh, that one's non canonical He's blonde. <laughs> I don't count any of the Daniel Craig movies. <laughs> I, I'd, I'd love if that was a thing among the fandom. That uh, no no, the uh, the Craig Bonds aren't canon because he's blonde. Whereas the uh, <laughs> the, the the one with uh, Peter Sellers and uh, David Niven totally totally is. Oh yeah, that, that's totally part of the canon. I uh, I still never seen that in full actually. Um, is the, that never is say it... never again? No, that's a that's a totally different one. That was a um, that was Sean Connery. Uh, yes. In the either the shit I'm gonna die. No, not either the late 70s or early 80s and it was like uh, a fake bond i suppose because there was like a an issue with licensing and um mm. i forget which company it was but there was essentially just been like ah no just you don't to um oh, i forget it wasn't mgm because mgm owned the bond rights but whoever yeah. whoever they were having this dispute with was like no we can make bond films as well because uh, you don't own them for this, that, and the other, and they got Connery involved to try and make it more legit. But it's just, and he was pissed off at MGM as well for contract disputes, so he was more than happy to wait into that one from memory. I think so, yeah. But it's just, I mean, I've only seen seen it the once, and it's just as embarrassing. It's it's just embarrassing. It's as embarrassing as half of the other Bond films. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> By this point, the quality is somewhat damaged overall. Well, I mean. Well, Oh, what would you say would be the worst Bond film, or the the one you enjoy the most, even though it's terrible? Th those are two different things that I'm keen to hear. The one I enjoy the most, even though it's terrible, from... Well, I I've got to say, like, Moonraker, I suppose, because th there was a time when Moonraker was like... As, as a kid, it was one of my favourite Bond films, and then mm. I watched it again as an adult and was just embarrassed for myself. Um, <laughs> it's true, but it does have a great villain. Oh, it's just I was the most over the top Bond. Up. Well, it's probably not the most over the top Bond. If he were but... played by Matt Berry, which he very <laughs> obviously yes. is, it wouldn't be too far amiss. <laughs> but he's got that great line about um, oh, I forget the line. That, that was Mr. Bond. See that some harm comes to him. It's just <laughs> magnificent ham. <laughs> Um, yeah, I enjoy Moonraker. It's um, <coughs> you'll have to excuse me. I'm slowly dying, um, <coughs> and loudly too. Um, I, I love the plot of Moonraker, where his plan is to annihilate the Earth. But don't worry, I've got seven groups of people, uh, seven pairs that I'm going to breed to repopulate yeah. the entire Earth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the the only reason that they did Moonraker was uh, it was very cynical in the sense that they saw that um star wars star wars yeah essentially that they saw mm. that the sci-fi was becoming the, the new genre so they figured they had to get james bond into space <laughs> <laughs> well if it's good enough for the critters and jason Voorhees, why not bond 
it's just, uh, it's, yeah. Um, can you think of any examples? So we're going to get back to Bond at some point, but can you think of any examples where the in space, space, space has actually been an improvement that's put a franchise back on track? <laughs> There's a question. Like, name name the best third movies in a trilogy. That, that's a really yeah. good question. <laughs> I um, think it was Leprechaun 4. <laughs> so some of them get as far as that. Um... I'm I'm gonna go out on a limb and say no. I I don't think that uh, that that movie exists, where they send um, a group of characters out into space and it and it uh, and it works. No, even Jason X is probably the closest. I I couldn't comment on 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 that type of genre, but um, even uh, I, did did you ever see? I mean I I don't know why I'm asking. You totally will have done the uh, the the Matt LeBlanc Lost in Space with uh, Gar <laughs> uh, Gary yes. Oldman. I mean, I do indeed. It, when, when when you're talking about trying to, you know, get a, a film franchise back on track by sending it in space, and then you see one that's actually made for space do such a horrendous <laughs> job, it's like, well, <laughs> that movie is baffling. It's it's truly a wonder. You know that that whole film begins because of a terrorist attack on one of the space gates. There's a whole subplot about terrorism tearing the Earth apart that they used to instigate the initial action sequence and then sort of move away from. Really? And then they bring Dr. Smith into it a bit, but it, it's very bizarre. No, I, I, I didn't remember that. Um, mm. In fact, isn't it... Uh, ba, 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 ba. So you got Matt LeBlanc. Isn't Gary Oldman in there? He is, yes. He's uh, Dr. Smith and doing, a, again, another wonderfully hammy job. That's. I mean, he is Mr. Ham, really, yeah. I guess. Um, that's his name. That name again is, is Mr. Mr. Ham. Um, I'm just gonna look for the blue chingo. Let me go. Uh, all right, okay. Um, is it Heather Graham as well? Is she? Yeah, that? Heather Graham. And oh, I always forget his name. He plays one of the Thunderbolt Rosses, I think, from the first Hulk movie. No, no, the, the Incredible Hulk onwards, his uh, Thunderbolt Ross in the MCU Hulk. Um, Oh, it's, um... You know the one. I've yeah, got Craig I Nelson stuck in my head, and it's not Craig T. Nelson. No. I, uh, I, I know who you mean. William Hurt. Yes. It's, yes. Yes. Yeah. You are That's right. the guy. Yeah. So, here's one. They always tend to make it... We will get back to James Bond briefly. <laughs> and other topics. But it's usually the horror genre where they say fuck it we got no more ideas left let's put them in space we did it with critters we did it with jason we did it with leprechaun we did it with the muppets but i would love for a rom-com to go that far like oh. bridget jones's diary 3024 <laughs> you know where they've just they've got oh, fuck shit. all else so let's just like barbarella it up <laughs> how many franchises could they potentially save by Dumping them in space like that. I am. Um, oh god, it's, no, this controller's still not right. Um, Bridget Jones. They made it to the third film, didn't they? Yeah. Uh, did you ever see any of them? I saw the first one. I. Uh... I um. I've seen them once. I think. I kind of always had a soft spot because I. I, you, I well, I mean, I still do really. Quite like Renee Zellweger. I just think she's mm. very sweet. Um, um, I don't have anything to add. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I mean, the the first one is is a total chick flick, really, isn't it? it there's, there's very little else to it aside from that one, uh, aside from it being appealing to women of a certain age and mm. th them all to kind of swoon over and say, "Oh, look, it's a Pride and Prejudice parable." It's so. Nice. Is it Pride and Prejudice or Sense and Sensibilities? But it's one of them. It's a Jane. Uh, it's the one with the zombies in it. <laughs> um, and then the second one, kind of, is not much of anything from memory. Um, is that what called the Edge of Reason? Uh, yes. What a terrible name. It is for a rom com, yeah. Yeah. It makes it. It's it, like you got nothing else in your life, and now here we are. The Edge of Reason. It sounds more like a Bond. To talking of Bond, it does sound more like a Bond. Jesus, stop doing that. Stupid control. Like like a Bond <laughs> title, doesn't it? Uh, James Bond in The Edge of Reason. 
James Bond and Bridget Jones in the Edge of Reason. <laughs> There's the crossover they need. Forget yes. space. Actually, no. Also in space. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, but I mean, I was I was intrigued to see the third film because apparently it gets really quite dark because uh, I think everyone dies. <laughs> oh, I hope so, including the baby. Oh, it's, maybe it's like Train Spotting, <laughs> where that's what instigates it. It's like I got to find a new man because, you know. I can feel the last eggs drying up inside me, oh. so I've got to get fertilised quick. And it's like, who better than the Shagwa himself, James Bond? And he's like, those are some very big punch, Mr. Jones. <laughs> Let me take them off. <laughs> and then they get caught in an updraft, and they get blown into space. And that's where the true plot begins. It's, it's a travesty that we didn't have you on camera for that impression. I feel as though that would have offered so much more to... Uh... To the visual. <laughs> <laughs> the trick is to eat cotton balls while we're doing it. <laughs> uh, yeah, seriously, I'm not this bad. The, the control is still broken. I thought I'd fix it. I haven't, so I'm going to need to. Uh, the, 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 the first episode of the Charisma Vacuum uh, DIY show mm -hmm. will, uh, will commence at some point this week. Because, uh, yeah, it's not letting me go forward again. Mm. Well, balls. Well, balls indeed. Well, balls. The fourth film in the Bridget Jones uh, series. <laughs> For a few balls more. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. What, what were we saying about Bond? Um, um, let's see. So we did the the best worst film. So what would be your lowest of the low film? Oh, I will. We, we've already had a full podcast about Jesus Christ. This oh, we have. Game. Yeah. Um, Way back in the day. Yeah, it, it's. Um, uh, Dino of the Day. Di Dino of the Day, without question. Really? Yes. I oh, I'd, hate I it would have passion. thought you'd said Quantum of Solace. No, Quantum of Solace is just misdirected. Uh, and, mm. and mis it's the, the pacing's all off and the writing's a bit naff, but it's it, it's nowhere near as bad as... Or... or um, Catastrophic, I think, is the best term. To, damaging. Uh, for another day. Damaging, I think. Because, mm. uh, yeah, as we as we had the conversation on the podcast, uh, Die Another Day effectively killed my love of the, the, the Bond franchise for mm. years and years and years and years. I um, I refused to go and see Casino Royale at the cinema uh, because of how much that film affected me. And, um, and yeah, I, I, I just hate it. I just hated every single thing about it. I hated Madonna. I hated just how um, it had returned not only was it doing Roger Moore again, but it was yeah. it was more Roger Moore than even Roger Moore ever was. Yeah, um, it made Moonraker look tame. It did. It, yeah, really did. And I, I just, I was done with it. Just could not um, be asked with that ever again. And you know, it's not as I, I saw it this, the once, and 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 that was it. I've seen it a few times just because I don't know. When I was a kid, I was like a, a, a big. Still trying to process it. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, in 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 a lot of ways, and um, it's just terrible. It's just dreadful. It's 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 mm. everything. Especially as I've got older, and my appreciation of the Connery Bonds have um, have have increased and enhanced. It uh, yeah, as I say, it's just everything that I grew to uh, just really dislike about what Bond became. And, and as, as I said, that, that was strange for me because uh, growing up, Roger Moore was my favourite. And then, um, I don't I don't know what changed my mind. <laughs> I don't know if it is just... It him dressed as a clown? Um, it was... I think it was just being more open to... Because I think Roger Moore was the first Bond... No, Brosnan was. That's that's a blatant lie. Brosnan was, um, but Roger Moore and Live and Let Die actually. I think after Goldeneye, the first Bond film I saw was Live and Let Die, and that that's just an amazing film. I just love it to bits, and um, and so I think I had a an internal bias at that point of like, oh well, Roger Moore's kind of the guy, and yeah. um, it took me a while to watch my first Connery bond um and so yeah I was, I was just kind of on board with roger moore and then it wasn't until i kind of lost the uh, you know uh that kind of tr nonsense tribalism <laughs> yeah. uh that, that comes with some of these 
things that uh, that I realised that actually no, Con the, the Connery and Terence Young uh, directed films offer so much more that they just they 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 had the Roger Moore shtick in the comedy, but it's more nuanced and mm. biting. Um, I mean, some of the uh, the uh, comedy and humour in 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 the Connery Bonds is just so it's it's like you know really brutal in in a lot of ways of just uh, not in the how to say it because they always do it they always make fun when they kill someone and stuff but it's it's just really it's dark. It's like Schwarzenegger levels. It's <laughs> I hope you're rotten hell, you vile gash. <laughs> That's just the he thing. He says, "Well, strangling a woman." <laughs> <laughs> pretty much, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's not really a comedy line. It's just vicious misogyny. <laughs> <laughs> but back in the day, that passed for comedy. <laughs> that is pretty much Connery's Bond. It's just uh, f flagrant abuse towards women while making fun of them. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh. But yeah, it's um. I can't remember my train of thought. Uh, but uh, what's your answer? I don't think you um, you answered the question yourself. I can't remember the question. <laughs> uh, just about. I was too busy thinking. If 007 were a Pokemon, what would its three stages of evolution be? Well, I'm no good with questions like that. You're better than me. You, uh, Ooh, you, you've got right. to answer that one. I think it would have to be like Roger Moore as as like the first stage evolution. Oh, okay. All right. All right. I, then... I see what you mean. Set second stage where you got like the the slightly cooler one, uh, that's your Charmeleon. It's uh, that's your Pierce Brosnan, and then uh, you evolve uh, depending on which the two stones you use. You can either get like the Brawler oh, of Daniel looks. Craig, or the you know the sort of kick-ass vicious snideness of Connery. Yeah, but I just love the idea that you throw a Pokeball and a man comes out and he just goes <laughs> Bond, James Bond, and that's all he can say. <laughs> that's amazing oh that's a great idea um i'd start with um now that i know what you mean i'd probably start with george lazenby and uh george lazenby into brosnan in no george lazenby into dalton into connery oh dalton of course yeah i think he's the uh the mega revolution <laughs> wait, 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 i mean you're a big fan of dalton anyway aren't you oh i, I love so. dalton yeah, his, his physical acting, his you know, actual acting is superb. One of my favourite Bond moments across the entire saga is in The Living Daylights, where they're having the, the debrief session at the safe house. And I think it's something that M says, and it, uh, it gets his ire up. And he just shoots this glaring look that sums up. You can read his mind and everything passing through it. It's, uh, it's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, yeah. Timothy Dalton did more in a look than all the other Bonds did with, um, you know, teams of writers at their disposal. Hmm. It's been too long since I've seen the uh, the Dalton Bonds, to be honest, so I'll have to go back to them eventually. Uh, I'm missing three jiggies from there. What am I missing? It's funny, because despite it being the only 15, License to Kill seems to be the only Bond that's always on ITV whenever I turn it on <laughs> on <a> Sunday. <laughs> Oh, there's a bond on. Oh, of course, it's License to Kill. Good thing it's my favourite. Um, yeah, as I said, I've not seen them in in a long time. I'll have to. That's mm. that's that's something we'll have to go back to and uh, and review at some point of the Dalton Bonds. Mm. Um. Uh. No, you um, you haven't done your best worst. Uh, best worst has to be Die Another Day. No. And, as I say, we, we've had this discussion before. It's just, it's so ridiculous. We're talking Joel Schumacher levels of ridiculousness. How how could I not love a James Bond film where the supervillain is wearing a suit of armor that allows him to control a satellite that controls a laser beam uh, that can destroy entire continents? Uh, and we're meant to take it seriously while this ridiculous Englishman is trying to tell his North Korean father that he's doing it all for him. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it gets fucking absurd. It it gets wobbly in the middle uh, because it's still trying to be a little bit serious and pretend there's a plot. But by the time you get to those final 15 minutes or so, 
it's just completely given up. <laughs> it's a romp of sheer nonsense, and I can completely get behind that. Uh, no, I can't, I'm afraid. Just can't. Um, we need to watch it together. I think that's the problem. You've been watching it in isolation. Whereas if you watch a bad movie with me, you get a whole new level out of it. <laughs> and frankly, if you can't handle Dine of the Day, then you are not going to make it through the five Michael Bay Transformers films. Yeah, but it's different because I'm not invested. It... Sorry, excuse me, I'm going to cough. <clears throat> hey, your mind. Mm. I'm not invested in the uh, in the Michael Bay Transformers films. Hey, um, even after 86? Well, I mean, sorry, I'm going to cough again. I'm just going to mic my... Mic, mute my mic. <clears throat> okay, there we go. I'm back. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, even after 86, I'm afraid. Um, Damn. Well, it's just because, I mean, that was like coming in at uh, halfway through a season uh, to see yeah. to see everyone die. <laughs> 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 so... <laughs> um, <laughs> That's sort of like dying of the day. It's like it's like you're tuning into a story that's you know several decades in the making, and you're just watching everybody get killed. Yeah, it's subtle, but they're still being murdered. <laughs> it's subtle, but they're still being murdered. That's a great slogan. <laughs> <laughs> it must be better than. Hang on, Dawn of Day has to have a tagline. I'm going to try and find it now. Entertain the people for a moment while I look it up. I'm trying to with this gameplay, but it's just shocking. I, uh, I've I've given up all. I mean, I was gonna make this a completionist run and um, try and get all the notes and all the jiggies and all that kind of thing, and I've just completely lost interest now. We're only <laughs> uh, barely, not even half an hour into the broadcast, and I'm just uh, I'm a bit fed up of Banjo Kazooie, but we shall persevere. And it, oh, persist. Yeah. Oh, it's got a whole wiki. Here we go. Die another day. Quote. Bond, you can't kill my dreams, but my dreams can kill you. Time to face destiny. <laughs> <laughs> Man, this movie's going to be 20 years old next year. Oh, that's, uh, that's the thing. Oh, my God. It, um... Bond. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, we're going to have fun with this one. James Bond. <clears throat> you know, I've missed your spa sparkling personality. Zhao. Punching Bond in the stomach. How's that for a punchline? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I, I, I think... So, oh god, Rosman Pike's in this movie. So Miranda Frost, the uh, the ever wonderful Rosman Pike, doing her best. Ah, I can read your every move. Jinx stabs Miranda with a knife embedded with a copy of Sun Tzu's The Art of War. Read this. Kicks the knife into Miranda's chest. <sighs> Bitch. No. No. <laughs> But, Stellar writing, <laughs> and and that's it. It's because it it made um, it made the purpose of Bond to be a a punchline. I think mm. that there there is nothing else of substance to that film aside from uh, the the punchlines. That's it. It's like it's it's trying to be a a um a comedy, um yeah, rather than a a a, a spy thriller of any type, and um, it's They're not even good punchlines at that. No, it, it and it treats its audience like morons mm. and uh, i just I'm, I'm offended by it i'm just offended by it in every single way and it's yeah you, you mentioned rosamund pike as well and i mean she she was very young then as well and, and not mm. as um uh experienced an, an actor but she is very capable and mm. um i remember the first time i saw it thinking that poor girl <laughs> she yeah she is just she's going through the ringer she's just so far out of her depth not only because she's not been given anything to do but she is just it's not that she's severely miscast for a Bond role, because she could easily be a Bond girl, but it was just so vacuous. This, this uh, there's a, a goober underneath that bridge, by the way. Yeah, it's, uh, I just, I've, I've totally given up on this. I'm going uh, to I'm gonna, I'm gonna put on Goldeneye. We're talking about Bond. I'm going to put on Goldeneye. Uh, so, yay. Yay. Uh, the screen might go off for a second while I try and do that. So, uh, yep, continue talking about... Uh, how terrible dying of the days. Oh no, we're beyond that. <laughs> the uh, the Vanquish became the Vanish. They had an invisible car that had spike wheels. Invisible uh, car, of course they did. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah. One thing that did surprise me about uh, that 
I was thinking Dame Judi Dench, and then I got thinking about Goldeneye. <laughs> oh, I, was, I, um... I'm in that place quite often. <laughs> <laughs> she is in that film for surprisingly less time than I remembered. <clears throat> it takes her a good half an hour to turn up, and then she has one other scene, and that's her done. I could have sworn she was in it a lot more, but I suppose she wasn't a dame at that point. In in Down of the Day? No, in Goldeneye. Oh, in Goldeneye. Yeah, I mean, her roles um, were always quite short, I think. It was, it's only really... It's only in, in the one that they kill her off that, <laughs> that she actually Boiler. has. Uh, well, I mean, I didn't say which film that they kill her off. Um, <laughs> the last one she's in. Yeah, but don't you, you're not allowed to tell them which one that is. Mm, true. She's in The World Is Not Enough, considerably. She ties into the plot of that. Oh, that's true. It's because of her that um, yeah. uh, not Penelope Cruz... Uh, is uh, in the the situation she is. Um, that's and true. that's sort of when she did become a main character to the Bond films. Yeah. Mm. Um, that's true. Um, Would Bond benefit by having a mech suit? I'm following on from the Dine of the Day logic and how we can sort of like, if this is the tone now, how do we... How do we just run with it? How do we say, you know what, fuck it, this is this is James Bond now. <laughs> do we go Pacific Rim and have him fighting Kaiju? I feel as though I've seen James Bond in a mech suit. Uh, what did I see James Bond in a mech suit in? Uh, is it Doctor No? Mm. When he comes, like, stomping out of the ocean? Stomping out of the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> I have no memories of Doctor No. I, I think there's a poker game in it, and that's about as much as I remember. You don't even remember the Honey Rider scene from Doctor No? The iconic Honey Rider scene? Is that where she comes stomping out the ocean in the next <laughs> suit? <laughs> stomping. I love, I love the use of that word. <laughs> uh. <laughs> it's, what works is that it's a term that's never been used. <laughs> To describe James Bond in motion. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, she yeah. does. She she, she kind of um, uh, gracefully emerges, I would say, from from the ocean rather than stumps. But yes, that that's that's the one. Mm. Yeah, my memory is better. <laughs> <laughs> in big clumping, stomping steps, she uh, she gracelessly leaves the ocean. <laughs> Um, yeah, I've I've seen that scene in more, like, best Bond and, and movie moments. But I can't remember its placement in the film and what it leads into, apart from sexual harassment and probably abuse at the hands of Sean Connery. <laughs> oh, wait, isn't he wearing a blue shirt? Mm, at the time. I can't say I focused too much on Sean Connery when I last there watched it. I must admit. Uh, so I, I guess I kind of get man points for that. Um, <laughs> no, uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, as as we were saying earlier about from Russia with Love, it's um, because <clears throat> Bond was still kind of finding its feet, and uh, it, it 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 was very spy thriller orientated, and um, mm. and so you know for that reason they're they're, they're less what would come to be more. Uh, staples of the Bond genre uh, going forward, which almost made it quite refreshing, I guess, to mm. to, to go back and watch them now, because um, of how gritty they are. And uh, yeah, it takes place in Barbados, I think. Um, and what else happens? Uh, that's all I can remember as well. <laughs> there, there, there's an underground lair, so I suppose that they they keep going with that. Um, I was going to say, trope. that sounds like a combination. A bit of the man with the golden gun, a little bit of the spy who loved me. Uh, yeah, is it um, Thunderball, the one with the volcano lair? I, I thought Thunderball was the one with the underwater base. Oh, you'll have to check. I thought uh, is, Isn't Thunderball the one that's set in Japan? I thought that was the spy who loved me. Uh, but I'm purely going off what I remember of the pre-title sequences. Uh, James Bond volcano there. Which is the one where he fights Boss Nass. <laughs> Goldfinger. Goldfinger. Mm. Boss Nass is how you remember Goldfinger? Pretty much. Rather than his name actually being Goldfinger? 
Aldrich, do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond. Me so expect you to... <laughs> you know, that classic line. <laughs> I'd love to know what your new uh, housemates think of uh, think of these episodes. <laughs> your... they, they applaud for me as I walk <laughs> through the uh, the hallways. That was a, a, a killer uh, Boss Nass in impression i'm sure that's... yeah i've got far too good at it over the years <laughs> james bond volcano base dun, 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 dun. right let's see um you only live twice oh is it you only live uh, twice that, oh it's yes. japanese volcano yeah. it is yeah you only live twice yeah that's right that's right so which one's thunderball uh i'm pretty sure that's the one with the the aqua car and tom jones Thunderball. Thunderball. I don't think that's correct. I'm pretty sure they all are. Uh, <laughs> wow, it comes so far down the list that it takes a while to find it. Let's have a look. Thunderball does. Thunderball. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it's the ball. Uh, let's see. Wow, what a poster. <clears throat> uh, so, find two atomic bombs stolen by Spectre. Holding them ransom for $100 million. Uh, leads into the Bahamas. Da -da 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 -da. Bomb search culminates in an underwater battle with Largo's henchmen. Oh. There you go. You remember better than I did. Yeah. Not that it did much good, but... Uh... <laughs> Well, as, as we were saying last week, you know, you um, you have a, a memory for these things, and mm. not people, but uh, innocuous but bits. In innocuous films. crap on films that I, <laughs> you know, the last time I watched Thunderball was the year two thousand, and yet still I remember all of that. The the fact that you can even remember that you watched it in the year two thousand is in itself uh, one of those meaningless bits of pointless uh, trivia. Yeah, pointless trivia. You remember? Uh, that's what we used to do for. Um, Sort of family, not even family film nights. Like during the <laughs> evenings, we'd watch the first hour of a movie, be it Aliens or <clears throat> inevitably the Bond films, and uh, and then we'd pick up with the second half the following night, so that we went to tuck it out and tired. Aww. So yeah, I remember working my way through pretty much all of the Bond films up to Goldeneye by doing them in instalments every other night. And um, your parents before and after said, "Now listen, Matt, it's important that you remember what date you watched these," and they put on a chalkboard. Uh, the date, and you had to memorize it for the first 15 minutes of the film before they press play. Yes, and then they had uh, a chalkboard with all of my friends' and classmates' names written on them, and then they viciously beat me while crossing out the names. <laughs> and uh, that's how we get to where I am now. The funny thing is that for all my sort of piss-taking on what movies are and what themes mix match with who for, you know, a hilarious comedy effect, when dementia eventually takes me no one will know for the longest time like beyond the point where there's any like hope of treating or slowing it down because everyone will think i'm just joking but oh thunderball yes the one where he has the mech suit and he's stomping out of the ocean <laughs> i thought you were gonna say that you'll just uh mold your your own memories with that of bond <laughs> bond and harry potter synopsis <laughs> <laughs> the, the ultimate life that I have built for myself in my uh, dementia fueled state. Yeah, I'm gonna have to search now if there's any James Bond Harry Potter fan fiction crossovers. Oh, you know there is. Da, da, da. I would. I just want to see the titles: Harry Potter, James Bond. Let's have a look. Shabadabadi. James Bond and Harry Potter crossovers. Ooh, so many. Um, <laughs> boring names. Big fish in a little bond. What does that mean? <laughs> well, <laughs> a villain is just a victim whose story is yet to be written. <laughs> That's the tagline. A villain Ooh, in the just... mid secret service. In what? Sorry, say that one again. In the ministry's secret service. Okay, that one's a little bit more interesting. This is an odd one. Death for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> I love this one just for the sheer banality of it. 
<clears throat> Harry Potter and the Prime Minister's Plan. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's my favourite thing ever. <laughs> oh my god, you're gonna have to read some of that one now. Oh, right. We're dipping, we're dipping bad into the old school podcast format, but that's just too good to pass up on. <laughs> oh god, this goes back to 2009. So we begin number ten Downing Street, London. A swirl of green flames fill the fireplace, then subside, and the new Minister for Magic, along with his poorly and now somewhat shabby looking predecessor, vanish into the flames. The Prime Minister dropped down to sit on the edge of his desk, his shoulders sagging with a mix of relief and intense anxiety. Relief that this bizarre visitor had departed, and anxiety, nay, panic might just have been better... better word over? <laughs> and then, Jesus. It's strange. Skipping your heads. It's, it's so a... the Millennium Bridge collapses. Sorry, I was... <laughs> okay, of course it's. I was just <laughs> going to say it's strange how how some of these fan fictions can actually start out quite competent, and you think, oh, this is this is quite well written. There's some nice bits of detail in there, and then they just descend into like a Serbian a, a Serbian understanding of English, and just the most mm. random parts. And you think, well, have you have you globbed the first part off like some other book or something? Is that is, is that how, how you how you've done this? You know oh, what I'm possibly. saying? Because that's that's when you used to read them for the podcast. That's what I always think with some of them is like, well, bits are competent, and then just descends into madness. Mm. Oh, here we go. Right, so I'll skip to the end of the chapter because this is in installments. So, ba 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 ba. Just for context. Um... Something about advising him. So, a plan began to form, and he, I'm guessing the Prime Minister, picked up his phone and dialed a number only a few people in the world knew. <laughs> Chapter 2. London Bridge. Commander James Bond strolled briskly along the sidewalk towards London Bridge. I wonder if he's the mysterious man they called. Mm. Yeah, so where's Harry Potter in all of this? Lots of Bond, lots of Bond. Da, 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 da. Oh, he's being informed that magic is real. <laughs> <laughs> oh well yeah this is this requires actual reading that's a neat trick mr shacklebolt bond said <laughs> wow oh wow this is absolute wondrous garbage how, how long is it I, i'm I, I can't even pick like choice bits to read at the moment. I'm, it, the Minister of Magic sitting down to explain the world of magic to James fucking Bond <laughs> <laughs> so that he can assassinate Voldemort. This is just <laughs> beyond wonderful. That's awesome. Oh, I'll, I'll send you the link so you can read it at your own discretion. But, uh, wow. Okay, so who's this by? Uh, just so that we can... By the Romulan Republic. The no connection Republic. to the probably connected to uh, the Star Trek Romulans. Daniel and send, and there you go. Now you got some bedtime reading. I might read it out right now, actually, because this controller is doing my absolute head in. Oh. <laughs> um. Oh yeah, we were talking about Goldeneye. Yeah, good film. <laughs> <laughs> Forty minutes um, later. Yeah, forty minutes later. Um, no, it's it's a really really good film. Uh, good action set pieces, well paced, um, quite forgettable, which just means that you can sort of pick it up anew every other time I watch it. I always forget what the first hour pretty much entails. How dare you! I could uh, I could probably uh, do that film from beginning to end, uh, scene by scene. I'm not I always forget that after he does that race uh, around with the, the therapist against um, Thumper Jetson um, they play a game of poker that Austin Powers does a fantastic job spoofing mm. and and then there's the whole chase for the, the stealth helicopter and no matter how many times I watch that film I always completely forget what happens, it just cuts to the Russian Antarctic base uh, with with the uh, the sabotage and it's like where did the helicopter come from and then it's like doesn't matter <laughs> we're going to to MI six headquarters now to pick up the plots but that's a good forty minutes later. Mm. Um. 
Wait, so run that by me again. What? What's what's the what? <laughs> what, what? What bits are you missing? Uh, the, the poker, well, the, the game of cards, or I don't know, cribbage, whatever, whatever cribbage. he's playing to uh, <laughs> to, to win. Uh, he he with, has a, an interaction with Fam Keem ja Jams? G Jean well, Grey. The, he's talking to Jean Grey. The character name is Xenia. So let's, Xenia. Let's, let's Xenia on a top. That's the one. I, I love that. <laughs> Back to the classic Bond formula. Uh, so he's, he's talking to... Uh, what's her name again? Zenia. Zora. Xenia. Xenia. He's talking to Xena. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know the Zelda references more so than the uh, than the GoldenEye ones. That's, yes. I'm, I'm shocked. So he's... <laughs> shit. He's talking to Zelda. <laughs> I swear I'm not making this up. Z Xena. Zen Z <laughs> Zenia. But, but you can remember that you last watched... Uh, 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 you only lived twice in the year 2000. <laughs> they do say the long-term memory is the bit that stays the longest. It's short term. Xenia. That's the one. Well done. He's talking to Enya, and <laughs> she gets annoyed and goes off with the guy from the thing that they burn alive. You know, the the redhead guy with the beard, the captain. The captain. And then she <laughs> then she steals a helicopter. And and then things happen, and then meanwhile, over in Russia, the GoldenEye satellite base, the one that they think is like the only base, gets destroyed. Yeah. And that's what brings Bond to Russia to track down the, the one survivor. But basically, all that stuff with Xena Warrior Princess, I always completely forget up until the, the point where they're like gunning down everyone in the... Uh, Sorry, I'm uh, watching the, the screen. Uh, gunning down everyone in the... What would you call it? The base. Yeah. Um, when did you watch GoldenEye? What, how, how old were you when you first saw it? Oh, many, many times. Uh, yeah, but how old? I would have been about... Ooh, 10, perhaps? You see, now that's interesting because I, I probably saw it uh, around... No, I'll have been... Yeah, I'll, I'll have been about... 10, 11, 12, maybe. And I will always remember the, the Xenia scenes because it's like she's she's having sex with the guy and then she murders him with her thighs. And <laughs> and that's when you realised that you were gay because women are murderous snakes. <laughs> um, You'll never see a man doing that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just... It's, it's like this really conflicting, horrifying moment. Of, uh, of being like, oh, this is this is really uh, uh, sexy, and I don't know if I'm old enough to be watching this. And then she murders him, and then it's like, oh, I definitely don't know if I'm old enough to be watching this. Uh, See, I think my parents came at it the other way. It's like, oh my god, is she having sex? And it's like, no, she's murdering him. Oh, thank god. Yeah, we can let the kids see that. <laughs> uh, can I... No, I didn't get it in time. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting how uh, the differences in kids growing up and what they see and what affects them and things mm. um yeah that, that, seriously no I, I, i'm not um underselling that that was like a major moment in my development of uh you know that was like one of the first i mean it's not a sex scene sex scene but it's you know it's pretty full on yeah um well she's she's enjoying herself yeah exactly mm. And then she squeezes him to death. violence, it's not just for men. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, what is your favourite Bond sex scene? <laughs> <laughs> um, ba -ba 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 I'm just trying to think. Are there, are there, there aren't any explicit ones. Um... I mean that no that I mean, is the Sean Connery ones probably that is the one when he essentially rapes pussy galore. That's pretty extreme. Are you being genuine there? Cause I can't tell. Near enough, yeah. I mean, she's not interested, and he just sort of grabs her, tackles her, throws her in the hay, and goes, "No, you will have sex with me." <laughs> and um, then she just surrenders. It's like watching three girls. I remember. Oh, that's a, a BBC drama. Okay. Um, I remember this hay scene. I don't remember it being that violent, but it's not violent. But it's just it is sort of. It's it's something that it's, in this it's day and age, is, yeah, is uh, yeah. is uncomfortable. 
it's uh, it does bring to mind that Family Guy sketch about 50 no's under yes is still a yes. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, in the watch. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, 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 I can't really say. I can remember any. Uh, the um, we spoke about Moonraker a lot for some reason, but that's always an, <laughs> an awkward one for some reason. I find. Mm. Uh, at the end of that, I don't know if you remember that. Uh, that scene. I don't know. Is that the one when they crash land in the pod and like everyone's sort of um, parting their boats towards them? Yeah. And they're like, we'll tell them we're alive shortly or something. Then they just, yeah. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Well, like, no, I want them to watch. <laughs> <laughs> um, do they crash land or are they. Oh, I didn't leave I the thought they commission. jensened. Yeah, I might be thinking of something else, but uh, I, it's boys. I just remember them. Um, they're in zero gravity, aren't they? So I just assume that they stayed in space. Although it's, you might be right. Is that the one? I think he's attempting re-entry. Yes, and that's why they leave yes. it. So they must have stayed in space. And then everyone just glares at Q. <laughs> um, I could have sworn they used that in in another one as well. What, that line? Or glaring yeah. at Q? A bit of both. <laughs> no, I, I, it, it, it has to be Moonraker. It's the only one that makes sense. But it feels like it's from the Brosnan age, where they just really went for it. And the problem is that I love playing Innuendo Bingo with uh, the Bond films. And so I don't know if it's me making it up or if it's the actual line. But when he's, um, when he's uh, having sex with Christmas Jones at the end of The World Is Not Enough... I can't remember. Oh, the official line is, I thought Christmas came only once a year. But I always remember it as, I can't believe I made it so far into Christmas without wrapping my stocking. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a far better line. <laughs> it sounds nothing like it. I <laughs> I know, right? But it's, <laughs> that's the whole point of Innuendo Bingo when you're playing with Bond. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what I always say. <laughs> Christmas is only a few days before the new year. <laughs> so, uh, what? <laughs> oh dear. I, I do like your line. <laughs> yeah. The, the Bond films, I really need to go back and revisit some of the other ones because the ones I do watch, you know, GoldenEye and... Um, one over dies, license to kill. They're the ones I tend to watch over and over and over. Mm. Um, whereas the, the older ones, the Connery ones, apart from everyone always puts bloody gold finger on. But um, yeah, I'm not as well versed in the ones that I should be. Yeah. And I'm far too versed in the ones I shouldn't. I've seen <laughs> Die Another Day more times than most people combined should have. I mean, th th there are a lot of bad connery ones as well as as, as far as i'm concerned uh, mm. uh diamonds are forever diamonds uh, yeah it's, it's oh, horrendous two great henchmen though mr oh is it mr quinton mr wick or something like that i can't remember but you're absolutely right they are mm. phenomenal and um they're wasted in that film but not only are they yeah. wasted in that film they're given the worst deaths i think of just like i mean that that might be wrong i might be misremembering that but for it's not a boat, isn't it? I think they just like thrown off they the boat. They just topple over of an Yeah, they they just topple off a boat. Yeah. Like um, ah, curses, water, our greatest weakness. Maybe they're demons. I think maybe that's why. I think they may be ex exploded as well, um, but it's still not. It's because it, it's done for laughs. Um, mm. And yeah, why is that not got rid of the key? Oh, I didn't pick up the gold mine. Oh, okay, my bad. Um, yeah, it, it's played for laughs, and uh, it's just it sums up everything that's wrong with the film. It doesn't know mm. uh, what it wants to be. Well, I think, and what came about more later in the Roger Moore Bonds was that um, the love interests stopped being strong, capable women who could match Bond. In oh, mm. you know. That's not necessarily always true, but they weren't just flakes. They weren't Barbie dolls. Yeah. And 
from memory, I might be wrong, but I think Diamonds Are Forever is the first Bond film I can think of where it's, it's just a floozy. And yeah, that's why I have a problem with the Roger Moore films because all the women do just seem flaky, flimsy, bimbo love interest with no real personality, and yes. it's not helped by Moore's r- ridiculous aging that just makes it even more sort of unsettling. Oh, it's, and, yeah. And then you compare it to which I think is like the lost masterpiece that people are coming around on now. But Her Majesty's Secret Service, I absolutely love that film. It's a great that's, film. That's one of the good ones I champion. Diana Rigg. Is amazing, and George Lazenby for all the slack that he gets. I, th- I think the problem is that he he's far more convincing playing um, I forget his name, Lord Ponterby Smythe, than he is as Bond because he's so convincing as the inept Lord yeah. that you almost think James Bond is his cover act <laughs> rather than his true persona. <laughs> so if he weren't as convincing as the the pompous, arrogant, dumbass Lord, perhaps people would have embraced him a little bit more. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I think it is. Um, was this? Oh, uh, the the Lazenby effect does hang over um, that film, and it's mm. as you say, it's it's a shame because he's not as bad as people remember him to be, and the film is far far superior than the um, than the stigma that's been attached to it. Mm. Um, yeah, it's it's great. It, it actually shows a bond with some emotional. Uh, emotional uh, resonance and emotional stakes and things, and yeah. it, it it is almost a shame that a you know, <laughs> with all due respect to George Lazenby, an, an actor with more capable talents wasn't um, uh, you know given that role. Like how why couldn't Connery stay on for just one more film and uh, mm. that 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 would have been nice to see. Um, um, it would have been a good swan song for him. Yeah. Especially considering... Diamonds of Forever would be the actual one. Yeah. yeah, and then he kind of messed it up even further with uh, Never Say Never Again, which is, is uh, Kim Basinger, I think, isn't it? Really? I think so. You might want to double-check that for me, but I'm pretty sure that... Uh, Let's have a look. It's like a really, really young Kim Basinger. I think she's like 18 or uh, early 20s. And that's as bad as... Um, I mean... <sighs> It's, it's difficult to get worse than Roger Moore in, um, it's not License to Kill. It's, um, it's the one where they go skiing a lot. And he, it's like a ski. She's not even a ski instructor. She's like, she's 16. I'm sure she's 16 anyway, this girl that the Roger Moore beds. Uh, I can't remember which one has the skis. Is that um, the one that opens that he's got the Union Jack parachute? I think so. For your eyes only. Yeah. It might be for your eyes only. And um, that is... Yeah, that, that, that's a, another film that I used to really enjoy this. Gone down massively in my estimations. Mm. Whereas films like... Um, yeah, it was Kim Basinger. Um, How old was 1983 she? 1983 as well. Um, ooh, let's have a look. Um, View to a Kill is a film. I know a lot of people say oh, it's just... Goldeneye, but with uh, silicon rather than gold. But I, I really, really like that film. Oh, do you it's really? helped by the villains. Yeah. It, yeah, uh, I mean Christopher Walken, you can't really argue with. But um, it was just one step too far for Roger Moore, as far as I was concerned. He, he was already far too old for the role, and um, it, it just yeah. makes everything else in that film a bit of a mockery. And I've never liked Grace Jones, even even in the film itself. <laughs> you can just tell how much of a bitch she is. And it just makes it even more uncomfortable to uh, mm. to watch. But I mean, that's just me being silly, I guess. Yeah, very true. I mean, it's a combination of uh, a catchy theme tune, uh, the fact that Patrick McNee's in it. I love Patrick McNee, big fan of the Avengers, and uh, Chris Walken and his um, God. Who who does he used to do the Sky at Night and he played the xylophone? Um. Oh god, what was his name? Sky at Ninety Fifth is not Patrick Moore. <laughs> That's him, yeah, and a villain that looked like Patrick Moore as the henchman. <laughs> it had it all. <laughs> There's some great stuff in uh, in that film, and it's got a blimp. It does have a, the blimp's the most famous thing about the movie. <laughs> hey there, bloopy boy, fly through the air so fancy free. I mean, we all remember the theme tune. <laughs> I uh, can't find how old she was when she did Never Say Never Again. Well, it was 83, so she was, you know, young. Um, oh, uh, good point. Born 
No, I was going to say that's marriage date. 53. So, oh, she was uh, 30. Oh, was she? Yeah, apparently oh. so. Yeah. Well, I've got that much. I mean, she on. was younger than she is presently. <laughs> so that counts. Hmm. We've mm. all got to get young someday. No, I thought she was uh, young, young, so I got that very wrong. Um, although I suppose if Connery was like, no, he wouldn't have been 60. How old would have been 50? No, not, that's not a big... Mid-50s? Oh, in the, no, in the 80s. In 83. Mid-40s? He, he, he died, was it this year or last year? And he was 80. Oh, this year. He was 80. What was he, 90. How old was Sean I think he was 90. He was 90. Pretty sure he was 90. So, what are we talking? We're talking 30, 40 years ago. Mm. He was 90. So, yeah, he was he was in his 50s. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, still far younger than Roger Moore. <laughs> yes. <laughs> far younger than Moore will ever be. <laughs> <clears throat> well, well, definitely now that he's dead. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, uh. Um... Oh, that was going to bring me to a point, or at least a non sequitur. <laughs> Who is your favourite dead Bond? <laughs> <laughs> is George Lazenby still dead? I don't know. Um, George Lazenby is alive, I think. Is he? By gum. I don't think he's I'm that old. He was sending about those flowers. He was. Um, he was pretty young, I think. Um, oh, certainly younger than uh, the other ones. Um. Th that's what I was going to say. How do you feel about The Rock being the unofficial final James Bond movie for um, Sean Connery? Which I'm... he always said was canon. It, 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 you, you're bullshitting me again? With this? I'm, I'm not bullshitting you about that one. The, really? the Rock, the Alcatraz film. Sean Connery s essentially says that that was his last Bond film. Oh, wow. Uh, I haven't seen it. Actually, you're kidding. No, but you've. Um... Oh, Dan, treat yourself. You've got to watch The Rock. It's one of the few Michael Bay films that's not just good. It's great. The Rock is a great film. That's when and it's Michael Bay was made still even better. Competent. Yeah, back when he was still competent and working with Jerry Bruckheimer, which I think is the main thing. Bruckheimer helped bring out the better qualities of Michael Bay uh, before. Essentially, it's like George Lucas and the prequels, where his own ego and arrogance and and everything just took over. Mm. Bruckenheimer helped sort of shepherd those into oh, to something better. Um, but yeah, the, for the fact that Sean Connery says, yep, yeah, this is like my 007's final, this is what happened to me before George Lazenby took over and, and Roger Moore took over the code name. Oh. Mm. oh I, I really like that. I'll have to check it out. Yeah, it's it's really good. I think you'd enjoy it. They wanted... Um, didn't they want Sean Connery for the Albert Finney role in... Um... Uh, Spect which was was it Spectre or uh the the Skyfall Skyfall sorry that's yeah one. they they all blend into one these Daniel Craig mm. films um, they really do that would have been I think it was too far gone though at that point wasn't he bless him uh, Sean Connery was he a bit uh senile I'm not too sure to be honest I know very little about Sean Connery apart from he was Zardos. <laughs> Bond? Who is this Bond? I only know Zardos. Yeah, <laughs> there is only Zardos. <laughs> and he just keeps turning to the camera and going, this would never happen to the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, something I only found out recently which uh, astonished me was that um, uh, astonished me that I, I didn't know it sooner was that um, he wore a, a hairpiece for all of his Bond films. Did you know that? Rings a vague bell. Yeah. He was um, very bald. <laughs> bald, James Bald. Bald, James Bald. And that's about... Um, do that's I... about as far as the James Bond trivia session goes. Yeah, I was just trying to... No, I, I, I think... Um, Sean Connery's... Uh, one of those actors that... I think in a few years might have a bit of a renaissance... In regards... It might be a bit difficult because he's dead. No, I mean in regards to an appreciation for the 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 films he was in. Um, you mean like the Avengers, Dragonheart, Zardos? <laughs> 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 um, well, I mean, there's there's a little. He did you know that he portrayed Robin Hood? He betrayed Robin Hood. That's son of a bitch. He portrayed. <laughs> he betrayed Robin Hood. Well, he's Scottish. <laughs> 
<laughs> Give up to the tax man, you cuck. <laughs> <laughs> he was uh, he was a good Robin Hood actually. It's yeah. it called Robin and Marion. Um, that uh, is the Robin Hood film, and it, it's about an old old man Robin Hood that realizes he's he's past it, and um, and struggles to come to terms with his mortality kind of thing. It's, it's good. It, um, That's a strange narrative to put Robin Hood of all people on. That's something you put Batman and Superman and Spider-Man through the paces. It's not Robin Hood. Well, I mean, the the traditional Robin Hood story is actually does um, encapsulate his death and stuff like that. And hmm. uh, I, th- I think in that regards, it, it, the traditional tale uh, or tales that they, they told um, yeah, I think it's I think it might be construed as canon. In some regards, mm. yeah. Would it be great if all the time of stealing money from the crown, he uh, he realizes that he's been defrauding the uh, the pension scheme, so now he's got <laughs> nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be good. <laughs> Just all the all the um, the the townsfolk kind of uh, turn on him when they realize that. Mm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's living it up like a man of luxury in his tree house. <laughs> and his Zardos Mankini. <laughs> <laughs> in a Robin Hood tale, Robin goes west. <laughs> uh, I, I could have swore there was a key line that we were thinking with this Bond conversation that we were going to get to that's been massively um, hijacked. What was the... Um... But we can talk about Sean Bean. We can talk about Sean Bean. That's not where I was going. All right. <laughs> um, I, I got nothing to say. I just, <laughs> he just nothing just conversation. Yeah. Dead, dead silence. Sean Bean. <laughs> <laughs> this is where we have a minute silence and remember all the times that Sean Bean has died on screen for our sins. <laughs> for- oh, he should totally play Jesus in a movie. <laughs> <laughs> his death <laughs> it's like uh, uh, even in Goldeneye you know he falls about 400,000 feet and then gets it's not until the satellite falls on him that he dies so like uh, Boromir it takes a lot to kill him it does so uh, his crucifixion takes 17 weeks <laughs> and five popes with a lance of longness before he finally <laughs> dies <laughs> I mean yeah I think uh, Sean Bean playing Jesus must surely be I mean, there there are obvious deaths, and then that is the most obvious death in, in all of. <laughs> <laughs> no one would see it coming. It's like, well, maybe, well, maybe in this story, Jesus lives. Oh, he's played by Sean Bean. Well, no. <laughs> well, you never know. It could be like the Last Temptation of Christ. Uh, I never saw that either. Oh. I, I take well, it. It's, that... it's not quite The Rock, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's worth checking out. Where uh, Jesus gets his mecha suit. Mm. And then he stomps out the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds like Richard Nixon. <laughs> oh, man, Richard Nixon and Boss Nass as two uh, buddy cops. And they hate each other, but the one thing they hate more is the man and his rules. <laughs> and they go, rules, every time that it's said to them. And then they go on a, uh, a shoot 'em up spree. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so... Okay, so they're the they're the bad guys in this in this. They're 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 the anti heroes. Yeah, it's sort of like bad lieutenant. Okay, all right, all right. Where they're both bad lieutenants, and uh, Sean Bean is the good cop that's trying to take them down. Oh, this is just getting better. Uh, but but it's but it's Mecca, um, uh, Richard Nixon. Yes, it's Mecha Nixon and Boss Nass, and Boss Nass has that orb he has from the end of Phantom Menace, and he keeps shouting. Whoo! And then he blasts lasers out of it like the tripods from all the worlds. What does that orb do? I can't remember. It signifies peace, Daniel. Is that all it does? Yes. Oh. <laughs> it's the peace ball of Naboo. <laughs> he just runs around battlefields being like, well, it's peace. And expecting people to, I don't know, follow along. I mean, for all we know, it could be the the, the queen's egg of the, the Gungans. Oh, that's a bot. <laughs> yeah, that's what was that orb? I never thought about that before. I just took it as red. It's just like, yeah, that's that's the orb you hold when when peace is declared on a planet that's never known war. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, you say that, but I mean, obviously, there's been some major tensions between the Naboo and the Gungans. I mean, you'd have. Is is, is there not some kind of law in there that about a, a bloody civil war between the two? Because that, I mean, I feel as though that should be a thing. It should be a thing, that's, but as far right. as we know, it's just just like no, the the Gungans are underwater over there. You're the land dwellers. Maybe the Nabubians encroached on their land because they've got those like ancient land temples why do the gungans have land temples with human heads it's a very bizarre society they have land temples with human heads yeah i'm pretty sure they're human heads hang on let's type in le phantom minis uh they go to the gungan holy grounds I'm going to type in Gungan Holy Grounds. <laughs> Let's have a look. Um, lots of video game stuff. Ah, here we go. Um, yeah, they're pretty human looking heads. Hmm. Which is kind of odd, all things considered. Do you think there's a person in the world that's just obsessed with Gundams, uh, Gundams, uh, <laughs> Gungans, they, Gung Gungan whim, <laughs> they don't, they don't even like Star Wars that much, they just obsess over Gungans and, uh, and collect all Gungan merchandise and paraphernalia, yeah, and that's where all of the Gungan fan fiction comes from on the internet, it's this one person who, for some inexplicable reason, just loves Gungans more than anything else. No, there's got to be one, right? Surely? I there's like one person so. for everything on the planet. Uh, I would like to meet that person and buy them a drink just to pick their brains. <laughs> I'm not even that big of a fan. That would be the interesting thing, where they're not really passionate about it. It's just something they do. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if you find out that the estate of Richard Nixon has bought the trademark to all things Gungan? <laughs> <laughs> We're pretty sure it's what Richard would have wanted. <laughs> <laughs> that man was an enigma, even to his family. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to think how else we can associate Richard Nixon with Boss Nass, but I mean... As aside from... <laughs> Go on. The brewing and brewing. <laughs> Well, I mean, they're both <laughs> over... most of their dialogue. They get in a car, turn on the siren, and then they both start, like, harrowing and... <laughs> <laughs> and it's just that solidly for 20 minutes as they chase down people. I mean, they both oversaw, uh, you know, terrible war efforts, I suppose, until someone else took charge and corrected it for them. True, and they both did bring about peace negotiations with, uh, you know... Uh, an antagonistic nation. Yeah. I mean, a, a lot of people say about Boss Nass's legacy is that he reopened negotiations with Nabu. Uh, yeah. My God, maybe... I mean, we love, we know that um, George Lucas loved his parallels to, like, Hitler and, uh, and Richard Nixon with the Emperor, so who knows with Boss Nass, maybe that was what it was stating. Um... I doubt it, but you know, I mean, let's let's give him more credit than he deserves. I think. Yeah, let's let's make that canon. Let's give him the credit he deserves and make that canon. It's what George would have wanted. <laughs> As if he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Only in our hearts, Daniel. Only in our hearts. Uh, what have I done there? Why did that fail? Uh, break communication links to bunker fail. Oh, great! Got to do all this again. Um, where is the, um, oh no, that doesn't work, what am I on about? Oh, no, I don't even know what I'm saying anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's quite telling, I think, isn't it, that the Gungans never got a spin-off of any kind. When you look at all the Star Wars crap that mm. just exists, and all the merchandise that just exists... You'd never see anything of um, of the Gungans. Um, oh, it's never too late. I'm pretty sure Disney's got something along the lines of keeping up with the Gungans, where a, a Gungan family moving next door to an up-and-coming set of, I don't know, yak faces. Um, 
and uh, and it's all about like oh there goes the neighborhood <laughs> <laughs> and it's all about racial tensions but in this case <laughs> they'd be right because fuck the gungans <laughs> <laughs> Fuck it's goodness. all about how sometimes it's okay to be racist. <laughs> <laughs> that is a um a life lesson that I think is is missing in this day and age. That's that's one that needs to be <laughs> out there a little more. <laughs> you know what? You heard it here first on the Christmas Vacuum Podcast Hangout. Sometimes it is okay to be racist. Yeah. <laughs> don't let the don't let the society or the man tell you otherwise. Sometimes you just gotta gotta gungan. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, but uh, seriously, there's um, there needs to have been. I mean, that that sounds to me more interesting than than a lot of things that they've brought about in Star Wars recently is the uh, the history between the Naboo and the Gungans and their obvious bloody civil war that uh, that took place, which is yeah. why, why they're so cold towards each other. I think that uh, that only makes sense. Essentially, we could just wait, make a um, a Cold War style movie. Cold War style movie. Yeah, um, why not? Like the growing tensions between the two that you know begins with paranoia and then it just spirals into out conflict and and eventually segregation of entire species, or Maybe it's like the you've not seen Aquaman, but uh, in that film they show the Atlanteans as once a a proud land folk, and then they accidentally did too much science, and the city sank into water, and they immediately grew gills. That, That's what happens in Aquaman. That is never the story. That of is Aquaman. the story of Aquaman. That is shocking. They're, they're on land, and then they go, oh, fuck, and then they topple into the ocean, and they go, well, I'm not moving, so <laughs> we might as well stick around. And that's how Atlantis became a seafaring nation. I'm, I'm pretty sure that if you decide to stick around in water, you know, you drown. I, th I think yeah, I think that's what happens. Think. There's, there's, there's little amounts of science that you can do in that short time frame to, to help you out, I guess. Well, that's just it, you know, if you're busy wasting your time on science, you're not, you know, spending your time growing gills and <laughs> becoming accustomed to great pressures. So, yeah, maybe that was like Otagunga. At one point, it was a, a, a noble city on the land, and then they just slew into a lake, oh. and they said, eh, we might as well, you know, become fish frogmen now. That would be good. I can get on board with that. Hmm. It would explain why, despite living underwater, they don't have webbed fingers... And their feet are cankerous stumps. Which, they're... you know, count me if I'm wrong, but those are two things that do not help you swim. And even though they're... Well, I mean, you say that. Even though they're underwater, they, they live in a bubble, don't they? So it's yes. not as though they, they actually live underwater, underwater. Then, you mm -hmm. know, humans could, could live in that bubble from, uh, from, uh, from what we've seen, I guess. Yeah, they're oxygen breathers, and yeah. they choose to live underwater. How ah. you get to that stage? Yeah, you see, I mean, the layers just keep peeling off on this uh, yeah. years, year, decades, generations long conflict. Um, there's definitely something there. They don't even need to be moist. They're just like, yeah, we 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 just live underwater. Simple as that. Hmm. I don't even need to be moist. <laughs> 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 I'm pretty sure that's one of Jar Jar's lines from the movie. <laughs> this Gungan ha owes me what you call a life debt, and I know he doesn't even have to be moist. And they're like, fine, take him. <laughs> if he says he doesn't have to be moist, then do what you want. <laughs> that should just be a running thing in the, uh, in, in the film, is they constantly go back to Jar Jar and say, Jar Jar! Are you moist? <laughs> <laughs> no, my are quite dry. Very good. <laughs> How much better would the movie have been if it was Watto that they accidentally saved? <laughs> and then they got this sleevy used, uh, skeevy used car salesman that they've got to drag around everywhere. I would have enjoyed that. I like Watto. Yeah, I was just, I was just thinking that is quite an interesting concept if you, uh, you switch out the um the species and uh i mean what species is Watto? 
uh, Tordarian. Tordarian. Wow, well remembered. If, it's one of those things. Yeah, if you uh, if you switch him out um, for the Gungan city, and mm. then uh, for the whole city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> get rid of yeah. All of the Gungans. Get rid of all of the Gungans. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. It's a, it's a, a much better film. It's a Tungarian city or whatever underwater. I think that'd be that'd be interesting. Yeah, I mean they're marsh people. I know far too much about the Tordarians from the Dawn and Kindersley guidebook from uh, the Phantom Menace back in 1998. And then even um, uh, and then even George Lucas is like, well, well that's not canon. Yeah, <laughs> that's didn't... a better canon than we ever had before. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, because originally C-3PO was going to be uh, a skeevy used car salesman, mm. and they changed it to make him more of a sort of uh, a homoerotic icon for the age. So they could have easily sort of like slotted back in uh, Watto. It's like, oh, we're going to regain the character that we never had originally and uh, and run with it. But instead we have the bumblefuck that is Jar Jar. Hmm. Hmm. Doesn't it always strike you as a little weird as well that Qui-Gon tries to rob the man blind? He, You know, he, he's a jumper oh. trying to swindle him. But Qui-Gon says, Republic credits will do fine. And Watto goes... No, they won't. We don't trade in that currency here. And Quaggan goes, no, no, Republic currency will do fine. <laughs> it's just like, no, they won't. <laughs> yeah. How evil is that? Giving him pointless currency. He essentially tries to rob the man. He does. Um, Quaggan's ethics are severely questionable throughout the entirety of uh, of The Phantom Menace. He's, he's, he's kind of lauded in this revisionist a gray jedi revisionist history as um as this prophet that that foresaw the downfall of the jedi but he was as guilty as any of them for exploiting his his power trip fancy he um he's constantly throwing his weight around and and, and mm -hmm. indulging in all the things that everyone criticizes the the jedi council for totally yeah he's a hypocrite yeah um I, it's it's one of those things really isn't it it's like you could easily get uh, caught up in the Jedi law that's that's built for us by George Lucas, but at the same time, you don't want to give it that much credit. Yes, it's like <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah, I could get into the philosophies of the Jedi Order of the prequels, but mm. that's like uh, kind of giving taking uh, notice of economic advice from Stalin. It's yes. like it's just. <laughs> Why? <laughs> why even? Why even do that? <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to take any advice from Stalin, he made some very good pita bread. <laughs> Did you ever hear? And I'm going to treat this as a pure fact because it makes the world a more interesting place. And you know me, I'm all for making the world a more interesting place. Yeah. That Stalin was trying to breed an army of ape men and forcing women to have sex with chimps in the hope of breeding the perfect soldier. Uh, are you saying that's true? I am pretty sure that is true. Because that, that does ring a bell. I just... I wasn't sure if that was Stalin or the... Um, who came after him? Was it... Um, Chris, was Khrushchev uh, the 60s? Uh, Khrushchev. Um, I yeah, just didn't know if that was like... Um, came after him. Soviet experiments in general because they did some mm. wacky shit. I don't know where this key card is. I got it before and I, I don't know. Mm. We're just going to... I mean, we've got seven minutes left of the show, so I'm just going to kind of wander around and shoot people. As, <laughs> as, as I often do uh, when I'm killing time. Um, uh, yeah, that, that, that honestly wouldn't surprise me. I mean, the, the Soviet Union did some crazy... I mean, I say the Soviet Union did some crazy shit. I'm you totally... Would. Yeah, I was going to say, you've done some crazy shit yourself. How dare you throw stones? <laughs> How dare you think that your shit was any less crazy than the Soviet Union's <laughs> for all those decades? <laughs> Cut to, you know, <laughs> surfing Soviet scientists. With... <laughs> like, look how crazy we are. <laughs> and Boris isn't even wearing trunks. And it's like, Boris with just nothing on. I oh, know, those Soviets, they've, they're renowned for being so wacky. <laughs> They'd be like the people, <laughs> like, Jenna, look how drunk I am and how much cheese is in my mouth. <laughs> that was a comment on the Soviet era from the 60s through to the early 80s. <laughs> Everyone's like, it's just the communists. Da -da 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 -da. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back to those crazy communists after these words. 
<laughs> from our sponsor, Jar Jar Pinks. <laughs> <laughs> We've been drinking water all day, and I'm not even moist. <laughs> moi, moi. <laughs> <laughs> How can we turn that into Speaking a of which, product? have you seen the trailer for the new Matrix? Oh yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, I um I watched it before we started and it is I I wanted to remain open minded and give it the benefit of the doubt, which I will do when I watch it. My god, that's a bad trailer. Oh it's so bad. It it's is so bad. Awful. It is It's terrible. All of my worst fears mm. uh, just been realised in that trailer. It's it's just not the Matrix. It is there. Oh right, what am I doing wrong in this that I need? Um. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It. What is that? There is no hint of anything about the. I mean, say what you want about the second and third film, but at least they kept with the style of the first mm. Matrix film. They, they they all felt as though they were. Um, part of the same universe. Part of the same universe. Yeah, mm. exactly. Well, uh, well, well, well said. Um, this just looks bizarre. It does. It, for one, it's too clean. It very clean. Where's the tint? Where's that sickly green yellow palette to everything? J just why? It's the first film again, but worse and bashing you over the head. That yeah, it, that's... right. Is it Morpheus's son? Why is it yet another black character? Why is it yet another sort of gothish woman that's leading him around? Why does he have to relearn kung fu? Why yeah. is it the Matrix again? I mean, that is the key question at the at the heart of it, really, isn't it? It's one of the things I was said to you was, I'm just really curious to see what story they could come up with to 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 feel the need to do this again. And, and it's just the first film again. <laughs> it's just the first film again. But with a uh, an a, an aging cast, a mm. secondary cast that doesn't come anywhere close to mm -hmm. to to the originals. I mean, as you say, the the new Agent Smith type fellow that they've got just looks like he's I don't know, he, uh, just off the set of like community theatre or something. He's he's mm. shocking, and you've got Neil Patrick Harris who. Looks older than Keanu Reeves. <laughs> he does. That's the funny thing. I mean, and I like to give Neil Patrick Harris's due as a mm. as a as a um, as a serious actor. I think yeah. he he struggles now, especially post How I Met Your Mother. But I, I always try and give him the benefit of the doubt. And you just think that's Neil Patrick Harris in a Matrix film. Yeah. And ah, oh, the first film never had that. The first film no. was always like, who are these interesting actors that I've never seen before. You know, who is this Hugo Weaving, the voice of Megatron? <laughs> well, no, I mean, he is. <laughs> no, no, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but, uh, no, Lord of the Rings came after, didn't it? It came a few years after. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's Only right. two, wasn't it? Matrix was 99? Yeah, Matrix <laughs> was 99, and then Lord of the Rings mm. was 2001. So, um, he'll have been filming Lord of the Rings as the Matrix came out, I think. Anyway, um,. Yeah, it. Uh, I'm. I now, in some ways, can't wait to see even more than if it <laughs> actually looked good because <clears throat> I'm just <throat> full of questions that uh, um, I think you're gonna have terrible, terrible answers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's sheer lack of subtlety. It's like, hey, remember the blue pill? Well, now it's nothing but blue pills. Mm. Hey, remember the cryptic clues about the white rabbit that were all about leading him down the rabbit hole and very subtle Alice in Wonderland? Well, now we're playing Remember What the Dormouse Said and here's a shot of the book of Alice in Wonderland. And look, someone's got a giant tattoo of a rabbit and they point to it and go, look, it's the rabbit down the rabbit hole. Alice in Wonderland. Mm. It's... Oh, God. What happened to the subtlety of the Matrix Reloaded? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in, in 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 one sense, you say, like has happened so many times. I mean, we were just talking about Michael Bay, the the fact that Michael Bay actually, actually did some good films in his uh, young years. And then you look at um, Transformers and what Transformers became. And um, mm -hmm. uh, what else did he do? There was a pile of shit. There was the... Uh, the um, Armageddon? The bodybuilding one. That, oh, um, Pain and Gain, Pearl Pain Harbor. Pearl Harbor, and they're just terrible. Um, and, uh, you know, the the longer... Well, I know... You, didn't you say that you liked... Um, not Jupiter Ascending, the other one that they did? 
Uh, what was the other one? V for Vendetta? No. They didn't direct uh, V for Vendetta, did they? They just produced it. Did they it. not? I thought it was us. Okay. No, um, Speed it. Racer? Oh, Speed Racer? Yeah. What did you think of Speed Racer? I've never Racer? seen Speed Racer. John Goodman's in it. That's all I can say about Speed Racer. <laughs> um, what was... Christ, what else did they do? They did... Um, it's not Jupiter Ascending. It's the other one with Tom Hanks and Halle Berry. And what's that one called? Oh, Cloud Atlas. Cloud Atlas. That's the one. And that was... I think that has a pretty core cult following. I think um, so, but... Yeah, but most films that don't do too well do. Mm. And I said that as someone who loves a lot of cult movies for exactly the same reasons. No, yeah, <clears throat> my point is that they haven't... Well, I mean, it's just... Um, I think it's just Lily Wojcicki that's done this film. Um, yeah, her name was plastered all over it. But my point is that it's not uncommon for... Um, you know, creators of a of a blockbuster film to then just go and ruin their entire reputation with <laughs> with what comes after, I suppose. Mm. Um, so, yeah, but th that just looked like a completely different series altogether. And uh, I mean, I am curious as to I don't know because. <sighs> We've had lots of conversations in the past about Keanu as well, and I've said, mm. told you all about my undying love for Keanu Reeves, as, as most people do, but, I, I, you know, I'm going to say it. He needs to change it up. Yeah. he just... We've had this, Neo. We're beyond it. Well, no, not not even that, but it's kind of like... John Wick and everything. This is, you know, he's he's this, he's John Wick. He's, yeah. um, uh, what else has he done recently? Uh, like, Kaboom. Um, there was the uh, Ronin film was it Forty Seven Ronin. Or oh, Forty Seven like Ronin. Yeah. And he he looks the same. He always has this long hair. He always, I mean, we used to Keanu Reeves acting in the same way, but um, there needs to be a bit of variety to to who he, you know, how he uh, presents himself in films. I think Very even true. even in Bill and Ted, he's, you know. Just essentially, um, he, he he has that same look. He has that same mm. look that he has now in 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 the Matrix, in in this fourth Matrix, and, and all the rest. In the latest SpongeBob movie, I'm I'm not kidding. He appears in that as well, doing the same shtick. Mm. I didn't know that. Um, so yeah, I I love Keanu. I think he's he's just one of the nicest, coolest guys like ever. Um, but and, and he's it, gone the way of Liam Neeson. Uh, yeah, about ten years. Where it was every movie was the same. Exactly, and he's had this mm. renaissance. People have wanted to give him some goodwill because of what a cool guy he is, and he's just kind of taken the piss a bit now and gone from um, an actor that people like to see to just being, oh, oh, he's back and he's doing the mm. same thing. It's like uh, it is literally. I didn't do it. Um, he is the <laughs> the <laughs> acting equivalent of of, of I, I didn't do it. That's that's a good way of summing it up. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I. I hope it's a good film. I hope that I hope against hope that it turns out to be actually more intelligent than it appears to be. But it's not good. I be, don't uh, think so. I mean, it, the first film's absolutely fantastic. Holds up to this day. Uh, one of the all-time greats of sci-fi of the twenty-first, uh, the twentieth century. And then you look at the sequels, and these yeah. are the same two people that wrote, objected, produced the sequels. So um, you know, lightning doesn't necessarily strike twice. And the fact that it's been so long, I know people wanted it, and they can justify it by saying, oh, well, you know, they, they justified it in the third movie by saying this happened before, it will happen all over again. You know, it's part of a cycle, blah, blah, blah. Same film, but different. Same film, but different. But this is lazy. Mm. This is two people that have run out of ideas and are desperately, well, and, and a studio that's desperate trying to cash in a franchise. But that's that's what this feels like, just desperate member berries for... I mean that desperate scrounge for new material based on old franchises that didn't need digging up. I mean, it wouldn't be a surprise if that's what we find out in the next few years, isn't it? That some Hollywood exec approached the uh, the Wachowskis and were like, mm, do you want to do another Matrix? <laughs> you know, mm. we, we literally got nothing <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, that, that we feel we can, uh, you know, make big at the blockbuster, uh, at the, a big blockbuster at the cinemas. So, I don't know. If you want, if you want to do another Matrix, here's a couple hundred million and and we'll let you do it. Um, of, of all the franchises, I would like to see an Agent Smith prequel film. Just get Hugo Weaving back to snarl 
and ham it up and 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 purr his way through the life of an agent. Do Hold that thought. We'll do that on the next one because I think that could be a, uh, a really interesting uh, topic to, to go into. Um, yeah, I think we'll put a pin in it there because I'm getting bored of this now because I, I couldn't get past the surface <laughs> level for, for some reason. I don't know why. I need to go and investigate that now. Cause, um... A James Bond that's tired of killing Russians is not James Bond, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, it... it um... When was the last time you saw Tomorrow Never Dies? Because that has Ooh. ties, that has ties to China, doesn't it? But I'm just thinking you probably can't get away with um, Tomorrow Never Dies in this day and age. It it doesn't paint the Chinese in a bad light. Um, in fact, it, it is it just set in Hong Kong. I can't remember. It, it's set in Hong Kong. Yeah, it's um, I forgot his name. Uh, Elliot Carver, yeah. Elliot Carver playing off the British and the Chinese against each other. So oh, yeah, it's it's very right. neutral in that stance. Yeah, 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 that's right. Oh, what the hell? Um, yeah, it's a good movie. I I watched all three of well, all four of the uh, the Brosnan films back to back. I think that same weekend. Mm. I um, I'll have to go back and rewatch. I haven't seen it for a long t time, um, and I think. I always watch it after Goldeneye, and so my expectations are, are always up, and it doesn't hold a candle to Goldeneye. Um, yeah, you should watch it first and then watch Goldeneye. Yeah, I'd probably enjoy it more. I mean, I still think that that um, that the Tomorrow Never Dies theme is one of my absolute favourites. Def yeah, definite top three. Um, it's that sting. It's like it's like the Living Daylights, where the song itself could be better, but the intro bars of the song itself are mm. just. Wow! Wow! They they get you pumped. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it is quintessential Bond soundtracking. Mm. Hmm. Right. Uh. Yes. We will uh, leave it there for this episode. I think we've. I'm sure there are more Bond topics we could discuss, but uh, I think we've definitely exhausted it now for for this week. Um. Yeah, that wasn't even the intention. I had so many other things that <laughs> I was going to pick your brain about, and and somehow within seconds we ended up on James Bond. So and it hijacked the conversation. So what do we miss out on then? And uh, I can't remember anymore. I All I can remember is terrible Sean Connery impressions and Boss Nass and Richard Nixon teaming up to uh, to fight justice. I'll have to see if I've got an N64 game based on that that we can play next week. <laughs> there might be an emulator somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and on that, uh, look forward to... Um, uh, I, I was trying to think of a good title for what that uh, video game will be called, but I think Boss Nath and Richard Nixon's um, uh, underwater adventures is 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 perfect in itself. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining us on the Charisma Vacuum Hangout. It's been a pleasure as always. Uh, I've officially ditched Banjo Kazooie. That can go to hell. The controller doesn't help, but um... <laughs> finally, <laughs> you and I are on the same page about Banjo Kazooie. <laughs> no, it's. Uh, <laughs> It's, I mean, it's it's difficult playing these N64 games when we're so ingrained in trophies and things now. In this day, I know we've had this conversation a million times before, but it really is the sense of, God, what's the point? <laughs> I don't have anything to to, you know, as a as, as a as a literal trophy to say that I've done this. So I'm just gonna uh, go with something that could be mindlessly waltzed through, and that was this, which I've uh, enjoyed playing. Um, yeah. Oh. We'll be back um, 9 o'clock next Thursday. If you'd like to come and join us, please come and join us and uh, chat and uh, all that kind of thing. Thank you, Matt. Um, pleasure as always. Uh, oh, you, you were done? Um, yeah, yeah. A lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, We'll leave it there. Cheers, guys. We'll speak to you soon. Take it easy. Goodbye.